Erev Tov, Chavrim. I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live, and uh, we have some very interest, a very interesting broadcast this evening, and that is uh, on live stream. Those that are watching there, the question is that we are proposing tonight: Are the two witnesses are they terrorists? How would the world view the two witnesses as they arrive on the scene, and are the is the world preparing for their arrival? Well, I kind of think that that may just be the very case indeed. And uh, as we go back and, and look once again at Barack Obama in his speech there, his interview on CBS this morning, America's great th greatest threat is what he spoke about here is climate change. In this interview, he actually speaks about how that they're going to get ISIS. They're going to take care of them eventually. He said they're going to get them. But he speaks about global changes, changes that would happen. He said, what if the sea suddenly rises? I don't think he uses the word suddenly, but rises five, six, seven feet. Or what if all of a sudden we have the bread baskets of the world uh, can't produce their, the, 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 the produce or the wheat anymore? He said, this is something that we cannot fight with soldiers, something we can't throw money at. I thought that was kind of an interesting choice of words there in light of the throwing money at. So it shows us that they do pay people off. That's kind of obvious. Or they try to buy the terrorists like ISIS over in the Middle East. But it doesn't always work. It doesn't always go the way they're hoping for. But another thing that caught my eye too is when he talks about throwing money at it. As I said, just mention this. The throwing money at it though is very interesting if you think about it. Because we can look at a couple of different passages of, of Scripture in regards to this, um, and, and one in particular I want to think that I'm looking at, don't have it up before me here, I actually have another place here, we'll come back to that in just a moment here, is in the book of, um, I believe it's the book of Exodus, yes, the book of Exodus, and I believe we're going to be looking at chapter 32 it is, yes, let's go to chapter 32 there, and in chapter 32, uh, or no, maybe it's chapter, th it's chapter 34, my apology, chapter 34 there. We're going to go down to verse 10 here, something I want to speak to you about here. Very interesting prophetic insight here that, that, that Moses writes about in the book of Exodus here. It says here, and he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do, well, they write marvels. It's actually in Hebrew, it's the word wonders here. Ve'yomer hineni anochi kret barit. Neged kol amcha, see, he makes a covenant, the barit, the covenant, and he will, and, and before all your people, or thy people, I will do wonders such as have not been, been wrought in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people among which you are shall see the work of the Lord that I am about to do with you, that it is tremendous. You know, the rabbis actually admit to changing the translation of the word from wonders to marvels. Their reasoning behind this is that this was after the Red Sea had parted. This was after coming out of Egypt and the plagues that had fallen there. And they never could understand how could it be wonders and that it would be greater that, that would actually secede the, the things that had happened during the time when Moses was delivering the children of Israel from Egypt. So they changed it just to marvels because they couldn't understand how that anything could be greater when Moses ended up leaving the earth. He died and never was there anything else ever done. So they just assumed that his wilderness journey was those marvels that actually happened. But that's not what God says. And he says he'd make a covenant. He says, Behold, I make a covenant before all of your people. I will do wonders. Covenant? Sounds like a new covenant to me that he's going to do. Now, then he goes on to say in verse 11, he says, Observe thou that which I am commanding thee this day. Behold, I am driving out before thee the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusites. Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest they be for a snare in the midst of thee, or in the midst of you. That's a kind of interesting. Do you think God didn't know that 
Moses would smite the rock the second time and that he was not going to allow Moses to go into the land. But yet in this passage here, he is warning Moses himself. Take heed to yourself, lecha, that you don't make any covenants. See, pen tacharot barit when you come into the land, when you come to dwell in the land. Wait a minute. God is saying to Moses that he's going to come to this land. And he warns him about not making any covenants with them when he does. Now, I say this in light of what Barack Obama makes in his very interview right here. In this interview here, he says... You can't throw money at it. Now, you can't throw money at it. He said you can't send the Marines at climate change, at these sudden these disasters that come upon the earth, these, these great big climate differences that are going to happen. We can't throw money at it. We cannot send the Marines after them or after the climate change. What is Barack Obama alluding to? Could it be? We'll come back in just a moment here. But let's take a look at another passage, another famous Bible verse that so many people speak about in the book of Psalms in chapter 83. And we see here, Lo thine enemies, verse 3, are in an uproar. They that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have their own leader now. They hold crafty con uh, converse against thy people. Thy people, that's the Jews. Actually, crafty counsel. And take counsel against thy, well, they translate this treasured one, but tsufanecha is your hidden ones. They counsel against your hidden ones. Well, you know, it seems quite interesting that the prophecy is there that there is a counsel against the hidden ones. They're taking crafty counsel against thy people, against Israel. They're deciding what to do with Israel how they're planning to come against the Jewish state, and at the same time, they have to take and, and they counsel about the hidden ones. Why? Because the Pope of Rome, he knows as a man that believes, supposedly believes the Bible, doesn't really believe it, he's really there more as a, as a world leader, as a, a dictator of the world, but he knows he knows that the book of Revelation chapter 11 speaks about two witnesses coming. He knows that these two witnesses will bring about a global climate change. Because for three and a half years, from what we understand, that it will not rain during their ministry. Now, we say three and a half years. We don't know if it's really three and a half years. But they're able to close the heavens that it rain not in the days of their ministry, the book of Revelation speaks about. Now, many people have debated whether or not it's Moses and Elijah or is it Enoch and Elijah. And I've actually seen one of the places from an uh, apocryphal book, uh, the Apocalypse of Peter, that suggests that it's Enoch and Elijah. After reading that, this particular document, though, I question the authenticity of the document. But either way, it wouldn't make any difference to me if it's Enoch or Moses or whatever the case may be. Nonetheless, we are going to have two witnesses that are going to come. Whether it's Enoch and Elijah or Moses and Elijah makes no difference. God will send them, and they will disrupt nature completely. And according to David here in the book of uh, Psalms 83, they take crafty counsel against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation, speaking of Israel, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. That's what all the nations around want to do it. For they have consulted together with one consent against thee. Do they make a covenant? They're making a covenant to wipe out Israel, to change it over. They make a covenant. They're with one consent. The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites and Moab and the Hagarenes the tents of Edom, of course, Edom, the Edomites, according to Obadiah, is the Vatican. It is the descendants of Rome, or Esau, I should say. The descendants of Esau are the modern-day Romans. Because we see this in two prophecies. Daniel chapter 9 also says that the one that would destroy the temple and the sanctuary, the prince that shall come, would be of the one that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary, which was Titus, the Roman general. And Obadiah backs that up. 
There again, you need two witnesses. You got two witnesses. Daniel and Obadiah clearly identify the Edomites as modern day Rome. And so the tents or the tabernacles, you might say, of Edom and the Ishmaelites, the Ishmaelite being the Arabs around the area there, Moab and the Hagarines, Gebal and Ammon, Ammon the Syrians, and Amalek, Philistia, and with the inhabitants of Tyre, Assyria is also joined with them. They have been an arm to the children of Lot, Silah. They've made a covenant. Very interesting, isn't it, to say the very least there, that they've actually made a covenant in all of this. Well, Speaking about a covenant, let's take a look at another prophecy in the book of Daniel, one that might surprise you. Daniel chapter 11. In some of the news broadcasts, we've already brought this up, verse 14, but I want to bring it up for those that may be seeing this for the first time here. It says, In those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also the children of the violent among thy people, he's speaking of Daniel, to Daniel, the angel is, so thy people being the Jews, so the violent among thy people, or actually in Hebrew, the real word for this right here, is the lawless ones. Uvene, which is the sons, the sons of the lawless ones. What are the lawless ones? Those that don't believe the true commandments of God. I'm not talking about the Jewish people there that, that are trying, that are looking for the coming of the Messiah. But we're talking about people like Prime Minister Netanyahu, that along with uh, Yitzhak, not Yitzhak Rabin, but, um, but along with uh, Shimon Perez, who have, Shimon Perez actually was the one that married Jezebel and brought the Roman Catholic Church into Israel and brought idolatry back in Israel, much like his forefather Ahab, who married Jezebel and brought idolatry into Israel then. Now Shimon Perez, back in 1993-1994, married the Vatican Church and brought idolatry into Israel and promised Rome that he would internationalize Jerusalem, give it over to Rome and put an international force there in order to do what? To fulfill biblical prophecy. They're trying to fulfill biblical prophecy. Now, according to this right here, the sons of the lawless shall they they will they will take of thy people, the angel says to Daniel, shall lift themselves up to establish the vision. Literally in Hebrew is to marry the vision, but they shall stumble or they shall fail at doing this. Marry the vision. That's just like where uh, Elijah and Jezebel got married. Excuse me, not my apology. Ahab and Jezebel. Where Ahab married Jezebel. Now, what do we have here? What is, this, what is this saying here in the scripture here? See, those sons of the lawless are going to do what? They're making, they're, 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 they're trying to marry. They're trying to bring the vision to pass in order to fulfill scripture. They're trying to bring prophecy to pass. And so what does Shimon Perez do? He is a son of the lawless one. But his sons, Uvene, the Yod at the end, the plural. It's not, just, it's not just Shimon Perez by himself, but we see even Prime Minister Netanyahu. What did he do? He went out, or somebody in his government, maybe I shouldn't put the blame completely on Netanyahu, but someone in his government allowed Pope Benedict an official seat there at the tomb of David on Mount Zion, given every Pope of Rome an official seat, making the Popes of Rome the official King of Israel to put it at King David's tomb there. But it does signify a dead king. That's one thing's for sure, a dead king. All right, now, they have actually made a covenant. They're trying to marry and they're trying to bring a vision to pass by doing this according to what the prophecy says right here. This is exactly what they're doing. And what prophecy are they trying to bring to pass? Let's take a look at that. All we got to do is go over to Zechariah chapter 8. And then we will get a very good idea of what prophecy these men in modern times are trying to bring to pass. All right, so we take Zechariah and we get into chapter 8 here. And we're going to go all the way down to verse 19. And it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month, and the fast of the fifth, and the fast of the seventh, and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah joy, gladness, and cheerful seasons. Therefore love ye the truth and peace. It almost is like a fulfillment of Zechariah 12, 
where they begin to recognize that he is the, the, the Yeshua is the Messiah. But notice verse 20, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, It shall yet come to pass that there shall come peoples and inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to entreat the favor of the Lord, and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many peoples, mighty nations, shall come to seek the Lord of hosts, in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Mighty nations, really. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold of all the languages of the nation, shall even take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. That's interesting, isn't it? All right. What do we have this? What do we have right here? Shall even take hold of a skirt of him that is a Jew. Yishahudi le mor. All right. Now, let me, let me back that up here. All right. So we're, right here is where he takes it. Uh, uh, of the nations. All right. The goyim. Bekanof. Uh, Bekanof. Uh, it's like a wing, but literally that we translate it as shirt. Uh, shirt. Uh, they take hold of the Bekanaf, Ish Yehudi, uh, a man that is a Jew, Lemor, saying, Nelecha Imchem, we will go with you. Him that is a Jew. You know what's interesting is they're trying to bring this prophecy to pass. What are they trying to do? They're trying to bring the prophecy up to pass where it says, Many peoples of mighty nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to entreat the favor of the Lord. This is why they're trying to internationalize Jerusalem. This is why they want to put a United Nations force there. These, these lawless men of Daniel's people in Israel have been trying to make a covenant with Rome in order to bring these prophecies to pass. They want to see that, there's, that they take the hold of the, the skirt of him that is a Jew. Are they going to try to say that the Pope of Rome is a Jew? And that now that he's there, that the people of the nations will come and say that we hear the Lord is with you? Let me tell you what skirt they're going to take a hold of. They're going to take hold of the skirt of either Moses or Elijah or both. Because why? When the two witnesses come on the scene and begin to open the eyes of Israel of who Mashiach really is. In the Christian world, who has been waiting for the Jews to recognize their own Messiah, they're going to see something happen in Israel. A revival will break out, not because the Vatican has tried to do something, but because the two witnesses are on the scene, and the prophecies that they have prophesied about are actually coming to pass. And then what are they going to do? They're going to want to know. Because why? The, the, the Christian church is seeing things being done. What, in other words, what caused the Jews to believe? And they will hear a message that's not exactly the way they heard it to start with. You have to understand, in Christianity, there's so many different doctrines, it's not even funny. I mean, as far as the East is from the West, there is so many doctrines, hundreds, if not thousands, of denominations with different views, and one hates the other if you don't agree with him. If you're not a pre-trib uh, or, or, or a rapture guy that believes in pre-trib rapture, you're out. And if you're the post-trib rapture guy, you throw the other one out. And if you're mid-trib, you throw both of those out. That's just one doctrine there. Well, then you got the other guys there too, the trinities, the oneness. And uh, then there's one that's kind of like in the middle of it. And if you're not one of those camps there, you throw the rest of them out. They're all going to hell. Then you got the Baptists that say that all the Jews go to hell. Then you got the, the uh, you got some of the groups there that believe the Jews are not going to hell, but you know, I mean, there's all kinds of doctrines and you hate one another if anybody says anything against your doctrine. But there's one thing, there's one thing that would shock the world. And that would be to see a revival in Israel. Now, I'm not saying that everyone that's a Jew will actually believe either. I don't think that they will. There's going to be a remnant even now that will believe. But when they do see a revival and they do see the Jews believing, they're going to want to know, how did this happen? 
Of course, you've got all these other different groups out there that believe that we'll be gone when the Jews recognize it. How are you going to be gone? Answer me that. How could a bride be gone? Because there's too much division among you. Now, I don't say how long you will see these two witnesses, but I do believe you're going to see them, or you wouldn't be able to fulfill the scripture where it says, Ten people of the nations will take a hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and say, Show us your ways. Now, notice, they want to know the ways, not of the way of Israel today. We hear God is with you. In other words, the Jews have believed they were there with them, but they grab the hold the skirt of him that is a Jew. They want to know what that one that come and got their eyes open. They want to know what he had to say about it that caused you to cause the Jews to see it. Because our church didn't do it, and that church didn't do it, and this revival didn't do it, and, and all the years of our none of it worked. The Jews for Jesus didn't do it either. Now I'm not against anybody that has that has that they've come to know Yeshua to be Messiah. But what I am concerned about is I won't even go there. Friends, let me tell you something. The question that comes down in this broadcast, though, are the two witnesses going to be considered terrorists? As far as the world standards, yes, they will. Because they're, they're in this big cahoots about global climate change. Vladimir Putin says it's nothing but a fraud. He said it's nothing but a global geo, uh, geo, uh, um, geopolitical we or weapon of, uh, the, of, the, of NATO uh, to stop nations like his from being able to do what they want to do. I don't say that there's not an issue with pollution, things like that. Because God does say those that are destroying the earth, he will destroy. All right, so we do know that God has an issue with things that are going on with the climate and the pollution and things of that nature. In that case there, driving our car every day is also contributing to that. So yes, there are issues there to say the very least. But we are, we are coming to a place though to where the two witnesses are about to arrive. There's not going to be no playing church. It's not going to be, and I guarantee you one thing, most of the Christian world probably won't like them either. Because the Bible says they will be hated by the world and they will kill them and they will leave their dead bodies in the street and they send gifts one to another while their dead bodies are laying in the street. In fact, that's when God destroys Rome is while their dead bodies are laying in the street. Ezekiel 35, and I'll share that with you just so you can see that for yourself. Ezekiel 35 is when that destruction comes. Uh, or when they, or let me put it this way, Ezekiel 35 tells us exactly when God is going to destroy, uh, when God will actually destroy Rome. You might think, wow, that's pretty wild, brother. I didn't, I didn't know we knew when this was going to happen. Sure we do. Um, let me get to the right chapter, though. I'm not even in the right chapter as of yet. Chapter 35, we'll drop down to verse 14 here. Thus saith the Lord God, when the whole earth rejoices, I will make thee desolate. And he's talking about Edom. Remember, Edom is Rome. In this short broadcast, we don't have time to go into that, all of that. But he destroys Rome when the whole earth rejoices. When does the whole earth rejoice? According to Revelation 11... And just for those that want to look it up for yourself later, Revelation 11, 10, verse 10. The earth rejoices when the two witnesses are laying dead in the street. That's when the whole earth rejoices. And according to this right here in uh, Ezekiel, you should, should read all of Ezekiel 2, by the way, chapter 35. Ezekiel chapter 35 is about where the Vatican took and divided uh, the nation of Israel into two different states, into a Palestinian state, into an Israeli state, and where the Vatican actually says that they did it with the intention to take both of them. And that's exactly what they're going to do. So anyway, will they actually be considered a terrorist, the two witnesses? Yes, because they are going to interrupt nature like no other people have ever done before. In this uh, photo that you get to see here on your screen now, that uh, this is where Barack Obama, uh, back in September, sitting with uh, Pope Francis there, where they come together to speak about the global warming, uh, the, to address the poverty, all of that. As I said recently in another interview there, 
or another news broadcast here, Pope Francis, he's nothing but a modern-day Judas. Uh, and he's no different than any other Vatican leader uh, that has ever come along. They claim to want to care for the poor. They, they're not there to care for the poor. Not, not even for one moment are they there to care for the poor. Right now, uh, uh, Guff Oil, which he owns millions in, in stock, uh, the Vatican does, with uh, Gulf International, as it's called today, also Gulf Ethiopia. Uh, they're allowing the people to be just massacred over there uh, in, in protests, throwing them out, taking their lands. They're not helping these people at all. Uh, all for what? For money. For money. Uh, anyway, I just want to give you a little bit of insight on that. It's kind of late here. We're after midnight uh, over here, but I want to kind of give you a little of this because this I was on the interview today with Hebrew Nation Radio there with Bonnie and Ron, and we just had a wonderful time. And the thing that came to my mind while we were doing the interview there was, are the two witnesses considered terrorists? And by the standards of today, yes, they will consider them terrorists. And I think that also comes back to the part where we were mentioning, and I said I'd come back to it, so I'll just quickly go back to this as well, where I mentioned to you about the book of Exodus in chapter 34. In chapter 34, God commands... Um, Moses not to make a covenant with the people when he comes into the land there and um, that let's see what verse was that in there that's in verse 15 lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land and they go astray after their gods and do sacrifice wait a minute that's let me see I don't know if that's the one I'm thinking specifically about let me just pull it open in my own Bible here that's verse we're looking to actually go a little bit further back um, he's going to do the great, the great miracles and wonders. Verse 11, Observe thou that which I commanded thee this day. Behold, I am driving out before thee the Amorites, the Perizzites. We know about that. Verse 12, Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whether thou goest, lest they be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall break down their altars, and dash in pieces their pillars, and ye shall cut down their ashram. What do you think Moses is going to do when he comes to Israel as the two witnesses? He's going to do exactly this. He's going to break down their altars. He's going to dash in pieces their pillars, and you shall cut down their ashram. For thou shalt bow down to no other god, for the Lord whose name is jealous is a jealous god. Lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go astray after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and they call thee, and thou eat of their sacrifice." Amazing, isn't it? And it, notice how he spoke about their sacrifice, that they will do their sacrifices. See, what is it going to be? They're going to build a third temple in Israel, and it's going to be the Vatican that actually is involved in doing this. And they're going to reset up temple sacrifices, and they're going to kill it, and they're going to eat the meat thereof. And God commanded Moses not to be a part of it. Not at all. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom and good evening with this prophetic segment on the climate change. Is there a global climate change? Is it coming? Yes, there is. There's going to be one. They've taken counsel already because they know it's coming. Scientists, the true scientists, say no, there's not. But there is. But they're looking at it from a biblical perspective and they're trying to make ready for it. And if they can't negotiate with the two witnesses, which they won't, and they won't negotiate back with them, if they can't make a covenant with them, they'll label them as terrorists. And they'll try to imprison them. Imagine the things that are going to happen in these very, very near future. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Shalom.